Hello. We're live again. Um, hopefully this time we're going to stay on for a little bit longer. We've got all the gremlins today, so um, it's quite nice. We've had gremlins for a while, so um, just to see, I think it's just to test our reactions. We're back. We're here. So thank you for those of you that have waited and uh, for the last 23 minutes, 24 minutes. Thank you very much for being so patient. Um, uh, hopefully everyone else will find us um, on the same link that you guys did. So let's start. So my name's Colin Way. This is Woodworking Wisdom. I've got Ben behind the cameras and uh, doing all the switching and asking your questions, which are really, really important. Um, I was waffling on for quite a long time before I realized that I wasn't actually talking to anybody earlier. So I'm going to repeat myself. I apologize if you did hear any of it. But um, below... On the previous link, we had some links to one of my um, uh, earlier videos, and that was how to turn your first bowl. So I'm going to refer you to that one, and uh, and we'll drop a link in tomorrow's video just to just if you want to get to it, you can. If you can't find it, the reason I I mentioned that video is because it's a similar video to this one, but it's a different type of how to turn your first bowl. Today, we're going to look at rough turning or finishing a rough turn bowl. The previous video that I'm talking about was turning a bowl from start to finish from a bowl blank, a dry piece of timber. Um, and that's when you have your lathe for the first time, the first bowl you ever turn, a how-to from start to finish. I'd advise going to see that one if you uh, are fairly new to wood turning because it's a good video. It gets you going from, from the very start of a bowl blank, mounting it to the lathe and so on, what tools to use. This is slightly different. This is... Um, I'm, I'm not uh, not assuming that you would have done a huge amount of turning, but this is a chance for you to be able to convert wet timber to dry relatively quickly. So I've got a couple of bowls here that we have rough turned, and I need to explain the term rough turn. If you don't know what, um, what I mean by rough turn, basically it's where you take a piece of wet timber. So you've been gifted a bit of wet timber, you've found some wet timber, um, and relatively big chunks normally, if you rough turn them, so turn them green and then leave them to dry. And you can see the sort of thicknesses we have here. Um, it's about an inch, about an inch and a quarter. Um, so 25, 30 mil. Um, but you can leave them to dry then and they'll, they'll take a fraction of the time. The general rule for drying timber in plank form um, is a year per one inch plus one. So a three inch board, for instance, is a four year drying time. Um, that's a long, long time and a lot of investment in time as well and, and storage space. Where taking a bowl like this, these two bowls, um, these were done last year. So around about eight months um, dry now um, and they are dry. They're ready to finish. Um, so, it, you know, the drying time is massively decreased. The other thing, if you try to dry very big lumps of timber, let's say that piece. So that would be, it looks about a six inch um, thick piece of timber. So that's for a start, you're going to be seven or eight years. And then potentially you're going to lose a lot of that through cracking. Um, so it could be a real problem. Um, but this will take eight months to a year to dry so like i say really really good way of getting big bowls um and um converted quickly so these two actually came from a core this was a coring demonstration that i done with a woodcut coring system um so i'm going to take this one i'll turn the big one we've got um just a small amount of time so it's going to be the same process for both of these bowls but let's do the smaller one so i can get that done quicker for you um now you need to know there's a couple of things here. So once we've turned it, and I'm going to just use that camera. This, that, uh, yeah, we can use that one. So I'm just going to line the bowl up. So look at the shape that that's gone. So what's happened, we've actually taken away the inner core of the bowl, and that's relieved a load of stress. So that bowl can now move and, and distort without cracking because there's no stress buildup from all the material that was in the center. What I now need to do, though, if you look at that, that's quite a quite an arc on that top rim so i'm going to hold this between centers if i use my regular push plate which you've seen me use loads and loads and loads of times regular push plate is flat okay and that's that's moved so much that it'll just get the angle just right you can see it wobble around on that push plate won't work and i'm also not going to be able to get to this outside edge here i'm not going to get to it with the chisels so instead of doing a flat push plate we'll use a domed one um, if you make these yourselves, you, you're going to be able to keep these forever. They're not going to be, um, once you've made one, they're not going to be uh, thrown away or anything like that. You can see the sort of curvature we've got on that. It's, it's a nice gradual curve. But now you see, in a moment, 
I can hold that over there and everything will be lovely. It'll, it'll work nicely. And that will also be able to cope with several sizes of bowl. Well, if we just talk about the material on this dome, and this was just a, an, an old bowl blank that I just domed over um, and then covered in router matting. One of the other links I did have for you uh, was the router matting here. So Axminster, whoever whoever's doing the Axminster bit for us today, if you could put up the link um, to the Axcalibur router matting, the part number is 340208, and you get a huge amount of matting in there. I've just used a small section um, to cover this one. Okay, yes, Ben, we've got a question. So a question in from James. Um, he's bought the crown hollowing tool. Uh, with the Axminster handle, um, would you be able to show him how the cutter should be set? If I'm honest, I'm not quite sure which one. The Axminster hollowing tool. Um, so a crown hollowing tool with an Axminster handle. I would do if I had it here. Well, yeah, no, I, I haven't got it here at the moment. Let me, um, I'll grab that for you for next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, we're going to be doing your basket weave bowl. I'll get one on hand. Um, ben, remind me after the day stream. We'll get that and we'll have a look for you. Um, otherwise, just send me the same question on email and I'll take some pictures for you um and get that back to you um on thursday i can't tomorrow but i could do that thursday for you so send me the, the the question there and we'll get that sorted for you um so okay back to the bowl so what i've done here it, it, we've already discussed that it's actually wobbly you know the the surface is not a true surface so to start with i'm just going to hold that in my chuck okay i'm just using regular c jaws hold it in the chuck make sure i get a good grip because the base is oval as well this has moved. This is not a true circle anymore. So I want to make sure that I'm holding it in a way that all four of my jaws are gripping. And I'm just going to true off that front face and just do a little cut on the inside edge just so I can get a good grip on the push plate. All right. So it's just a, a fairly easy way of doing it. Your alternative, of course, would be to do what I'm doing here and then just cut a recess on the internal part of that um, of that bowl blank. And then we can expand something like long reach jaws or even something really, really deep like these jaws here. These are um, hollow form jaws, actually. They could go in and expand. You know, anything like that that could go in and expand into a recess. It's another way of creating the, uh, you know, a good hold to turn the back. We, however, are just going to face off the front. Okay. Lay speed to zero. Turn the lathe on. Everything's nice and tight. I'm just going to skim that, make that flat. First of all, and we're going to use a 3 8 bowl gouge, so a, a 10 mil bowl gouge initially. We, these have just been sharpened. I sharpened them before we came on. So I'm just going to clean this surface. There we are. So we've got a nice flat face. Do be a little bit careful now, because what we're creating is quite a sharp edge. So especially the outside edge is, is quite sharp. Um, so fingers touching that outside edge could be cut quite quickly. And then I'll just skim a small cut. It's not actually too bad. There we are. That's all I need to. As long as I've got a nice clean edge that I can grip with the push plate. Tool rest, sorry, tail stop needs to come back on again. And I'm going to use a ring center here. So rather than a single pointed center, we're going to use a ring center. It's just a bit more grip um, than everything else. So oh, I say everything else, almost everything else. I'll show you in a minute. Um, another another option so we can take that shut all the way off now 
And if you've got several of these to do, and again, if you're roughing down one bow, you may as well rough down several if you have the timber for, uh, spare. If you're going to do several, just prep everything with a chuck on, so get all your bowls ready for the push plate, and then you can swap things around. Yes, Ben? So a question from Martin. He has the AC370WL. Um, is there any way to modify it to get the headstock hand wheel on it? To get the headstock hand wheel on it? So I think that's the one with the the, um, the spindle is kind of tucked into the cowling on the... Not quite, I don't quite follow on that one. Don't quite follow. Again, email me that one. We'll sort the question out for you. Um, explain what you mean. If you have any pictures, even more helpful. And then um, I'll be able to answer. I'm not quite sure what you mean there. Look, all I've done here on that dome, now we've got a clean face and a clean inner edge, is I'm able now to use the tailstock to push that up against. What we're going to do is clean up this outside surface, get that sanded, also create the base as well. Get that finished, then we can sand, um, and then we'll put a finish on it. And that's going to be your choice in a minute. Let's just ask, answer one of these questions, and then I'm going to carry on. Yes, Ben? So this from Sleeping Dog. Um, he has a pile of big rough turn cord oak bowls uh, ready to go, but some have open cracks. He'd like to fill it with coloured resin, resin, but not sure the best way to get the resin in and keep it in. Any advice, please? Yeah, absolutely. I've done this quite a, quite a lot. Um, get a good masking tape or old milk bottle cartons, the plastic ones, um, and hot milk glue. Either of those work really, really well. So when I say masking tape, I mean like the um, the gorilla tape, so the the silver um, duct tape, that sort of stuff. Um, that that's really good. I wouldn't rely on just one piece, several pieces, or like I say, cut open the milk bottle carton um, and then hot melt glue all the way around. Really, really good sealer. But you're dead right; it has to be sealed with resin. Think of it like water. If water can escape, so will the resin. So absolutely important that you get good seal on that. Yes, Ben. And from Eggman, is it possible to buy lathe parts individually uh, from Axminster, like just the drive spindle and pulley, for example? Some parts available, yes. Pulleys most of the time will be. Um, and again, the same with spindles. Some will have to be ordered, though. So that will need a phone call, need an email to find out exactly which part. Um, myself or Ben, we're not... We, no, we haven't got um, access to any lists of, of parts, so it'd be best going through the after-sales guys for that one. But yeah, some parts, absolutely. We have to repair things from time to time, um, so we need access to parts ourselves, you know. There we are. So we've got held between centers now. Now we're free to clean up this outside surface. This is a piece of ash. It's not going to take too much cleaning up. So all I'm going to do, first of all, is create the base. Um, the base is pretty much the size I want it. I just need to make it round. And this is only going to be a base for, for holding to support. I'm going to ha actually have a flat base to the bowl. Here we are. Clean up this outer face as well. we are and then i'm just using a skew cut so what i'm doing is using the bottom edge of the bowl gouge almost like a skew and you get these lovely little shavings come off i'm doing that until i can get the bevel to rub and it's going to take a while because i've got the casting of the tailstock in the way nearly there now a nice little flick to the main base there we are i should be almost ready to do the outside curve just refining that base now Yes, Ben, another question. 
Um, so Sol would like um, some advice on bowl gouge size. Is it just big, bigger project, bigger bowl gouge? You got it. Yeah. So if you were doing a bigger bowl, for instance, the other one that I showed you earlier, then it may be that I need to go to the half inch gouge. But a 3.8 or 10 mil is perfect for this type. This bowl size. Yes, Ben. And Terry would like to know, after roughing a wet turn bowl, um, how do you stop it cracking? Um, if you've roughed the wet turn bowl and you've kept it somewhere that's not too hot, not a lot of um, airflow, um, as in wind blowing through, it's out of direct sunlight, all those sorts of things, you should minimise cracking. Some timbers you can't. So if you talk eucalyptus, for instance, some fruit timbers, they're problematic. Um, holly is another uh, troublesome one. But get down to that inch, inch and a quarter, you should find that 90% of your bowls don't crack. Um, unless they have a crack already in them, then there's an issue. Okay, So it's just where you store them, out of the direct sunlight, somewhere that's not too hot. Don't take them indoors. Central heating will open a bowl up straight away. Well, I think we're nearly there. Just take out a little bit of a lump that I've seen there. Check for those lumps and bumps. I think that's all right. We'll, we'll go with that. Let's stop the label. Just show you why we are in terms of finish. And I think we're good to go. A little bit of a line in there I want to get rid of. There we are. Just clean that out of the way. Right. Let's think about sanding. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that um, I want you guys to get involved in the finish. So I've got a few finishes up here. Um, the two I prefer to go with on a bowl like this, either finishing oil um, or, or food safe oil um, or sanding sealer and wax. So we'll leave it to the vote. So start voting. Ben's going to count them up and let me know which finish you want to go with. And we can then explore that a little bit. But apart from um, the sanding now, that's that bowl finish. A lovely bit of ash. You've got some little bits of, um, of olive running through it, matching up on both sides. And that's uh, dead easy. You can see nothing too taxing on that. Now we're going to have the dust extraction running. I'm going to work through my hand, sanding grades 100 to 400. And I'm also going to use a bowl sander as well, so rotary sander. But dust extraction is going on. You should still hear me, no problem. Really, really important. Because I'm not wearing any breathing apparatus as I'm talking to you guys, I need all of that dust taken away. So lay speed slightly slower. So it's the dust doesn't go airborne. Starting with a hundred grit, let's do all the, the hard work with the coarser grades, and then we'll work our way up and through. So this first grit, number 100, or whatever to you choose to go with, to start with, this is the one that does all the hard work. I'm going to spend more time on this one than any other grade. What I want with this one is to take away any turning lines, any tears, any nasties, and then all the other grades just take away the previous sanding marks. <laughs> there must be a few votes coming in because Ben's getting a pen and paper. There we are. Um, let's just have a look and see where we are. So what I'm looking for now are exactly what I said. Any turning lines that might be there, any tears that are visible. And I can see just a couple of tears up high that I want to carry on to get rid of. 
But, you know, apart from those, it's looking fairly good at the moment. I'll be honest with you, ash is one of those timbers. It, it, it looks after you. It's a nice timber to use. Um, it finishes nicely off the tool. It sounds nicely as well. Good sharp tools make a massive difference. There we are. So that's enough with that one. So we move on and up through the greys now. I've got to um, thank you all as well. You've um, been giving us some good suggestions for future videos. I've made a note of them and you will see them popping up in schedules now. Next week, for instance, the basket we bowl, that was one of your suggestions that we're going to have a go at and see what we can do. So um, I'll encourage you, please, as much as possible, give us all suggestions. That's not just me. That's in every discipline that we show on Board Working Wisdom. Um, the more info and, and uh, feedback we can get from you, the better. Yes, Ben, questions? Could you use a sanding sealer, uh, sorry, a sanding paste like Yorkshire grit to help sand without the dust? If I use a sanding paste like Yorkshire grit, Will it stand without the dust? Yeah, it will. Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. But they ge the generally, that's on the later stages. It's not from scratch. Um, pardon the pun. It's, it's when you're getting to those finer stages. However, if you're starting to sand or you're sanding timbers that are, are prone to clogging the paper, using a wax with your sanding. So when I say a wax, I mean your regular wax. Um, finishing uh, waxes, um, I've got one of the micro christening waxes there. Use that on the paper and that'll create a slurry rather than um, rather than um, like a, a, a clogging to your paper. Um, and so a little tip that I was given on the first wood turning cruise, Norwegian wood turning cruise, way back, way back, um, by Bert Marsh. Um, and he said, yeah, use a little bit of wax. We don't want to get any dust in here because we were working in a, um, basically in a, um, a carport on a ferry. Um, so by using that, we didn't have dust and we didn't have any heat build up. Um, and it didn't come the paper. It was perfect. Good for smaller projects though. Don't use that on big, big bowls because you'll be there forever. You'll use loads of wax and you make an awful mess. There we are. That's 150. So now let's go with our rotary sander so let's start with a 180 grit on the rotary sander i'm going to up the speed a little bit you can use a um a power sander absolutely if you use a power sander you could get rid of a load of the hand sanding as well it would take a lot um it'll speed the process up a lot there we are let's just have a look the idea by using a rotary sander now, I want to get rid of the, the lines I've created with the hand sanding, and they've all gone. So we're already at a point where we can start introducing things like 240s and 400 grits. So I'm going to go straight in with a 240 on the hand sanding. There we are. Now we're going to go 400 on a bit of, bit of hand sanding, and then we go 400 on the rotary again, and that'll be us done. There we are. So that was 400. We'll do the same now on the rotary sander. Have a quick look at that. It's lovely. That's really giving us a really nice finish very, very quickly. There's no scratches left there. Um, if there were, then I'd go back and start again, um, maybe with a 240, for instance, to get rid of those or a bit more rotary sanding. So how are we on the um, finish front? 
So we've got um, it's pretty even actually, um, but there's a few suggestions of a sanding sealer and wax on the outside with food safe in the middle. Yeah, we can do that. Why not? Why not? So let's go that way. So sanding sealer, so sanding sealer. Yes, you got another question as well, Ben. Uh, yeah, a couple of questions here. Um, first one from Fuller. Um, he's saying, considering that efficient dust extraction depends on capturing it nearest the source, yep. um, does anybody manufacture a dust collection shroud that would more fully encompass the, the chuck and workpiece? No, not for wood turning, unfortunately. Um, there are what we call big mouths, which are basically a big funnel, which will go there. To, to work those, though, you need to have quite a powerful extractor because by creating a funnel... The, the actual nozzle bit is is um, further back and it dissipates um, as it spreads out. So it's great for catching um, fine dust. If you're doing um, big bowls, then it, it, it will struggle a little bit. Um, but uh, this sort of thing, it would work. They're called big mouths. They're literally a, a plastic nozzle head that goes on the end of, of, uh, of your dust extractor. They work quite well. And then um, this is from Cliff. Um, he's asking um, that, sorry, last week you replied that um, you would check on an adjustable boring bit um, that you use. Uh, was it the Axminster one or was it the Japanese version? It was the Axminster one. Yeah, it was the Axminster one. I haven't brought it in, but I've got two now. Um, work brilliantly. The only thing with them, I would say, is if you're doing very hard end grain, they don't work very well. Side grain, beautiful. The fact that I can vary them uh, literally just with a grub screw um, and on an Allen key um, is, is fantastic. You, we all know how expensive force the bits and sawtooth bits can be. So for side grain, absolutely spot on, um, but not end grain. All right. There we are. So sanding sealer. This is the cellulose, cellulose-based sanding sealer. 50-50 uh, mix of cellulose thinners and sealer. So a nice dilute mix. I do that out of my preference because it soaks in further, dries very, very quickly, cuts through any uh, waxes that may naturally be in the timber, all those sorts of things. Absolutely, the manufacturer will say don't water it down because you don't have to. But those are my reasons for watering it down with um, thinners. It will go in further, cut through and dry quickly. There we are. If I wipe off the excess. The difference that we're going to get between a sanding sealer and a wax finish um, and an oil finish is the um, the brightness, so the, the how glossy it will be. This will be quite a glossy finish, this wax. And if that's what you want, fantastic. The difference with it and the oil, um, apart from the finish, is the resistant to moisture. So the oil, you can put literally um, wet things inside and reuse it over and over again what moisture does lift um uh, wax so you will see where the water's been moisture's been well a microcrystalline has a water inhibitor in it so when you hear of microcrystalline waxes basically that's um resistant to finger uh, prints of not fingerprints but touched by fingers um uh, humidity in the air those sorts of things so it, it's resistant to that it doesn't mean it's waterproof in any way yes ben so it's a question I missed from earlier. Sorry about that, Terry. Um, he's asking, can you put a different finish on after it's been oiled? You can put a wax over oil. Um, oil over wax doesn't seem to work very well. But, yeah, wax over oil works quite nicely. Um, you won't get as, as bright a finish. But, yes, that sanding cedar, I'm just going to denib. So basically what I'm meaning by denib, any liquid you put on the surface of timber raises the grain up, those little microfibers. So what we're going to do now by using a 600, so quite a fine abrasive, is just denib. Remember, the sanding sealer is not a finish. It is a preparation for your finish. It's creating the canvas. So you're not losing anything by sanding this back now, just lightly anyway. And then we're going to put a wax on the top. There we are. So I'm going to use the wax that's on my... Well, I've got two there. Let's just have a look at them both. So watch this one. This is the microcrystalline uh, restoration wax. It's used, when they call it restoration wax, it's, um, the idea came from museums. It's uh, the, the um, people in the museums would uh, wax the, um, the wooden objects because then if they did get um, uh, touched a lot, then it uh, is a little bit of an inhibitor against the acids and the moisture in, in skin and, and touch. So that's why it's got that name. Um, but 
there isn't a lot of a difference, if I'm honest, between the finish on these two. This is clear paste wood wax, and that's the restoration wax. Um, it's just that that one's got a that, that water inhibitor. So it doesn't really matter which I use. That's my little can opener. We'll use that one because it's there. Color color is very similar as well. In fact, you wouldn't tell the difference. Very different uh, smells. There we are. So they look very similar to each other. They are different. <laughs> I can, I honest, I'll be honest with you there. That one's a lot stronger than that one. It's more turpentine, the restoration wax. So let's give it a coat. I haven't got any to hand, but I do prefer putting this stuff on with um, grey web racks. It's a slight, a slight um, abrasive... There we are. So I like to apply this without the lathe running. The reason being, I want to make sure that that wax is re really going into all the little fibers, into the pores. If you do it with a lathe uh, running, so sorry, I meant with a lathe off, do it with a lathe running, what you find is you'll skip over all the low points. But this way, you can really get it nourishing the timber, getting right in. And in an ideal world, once you put this on, go and have a cup of tea. Just give it 10, 15 minutes and then give it a burnish off. I'm not going to do that, of course. You've been waiting long enough today, so let's we will do that straight away. There we are. So that's fully covered. We're going to oil the, out, the inside, remember. There we are. So instead of going straight onto the tissue now, let's go with some um, shavings just to take off the excess and then buff up with the tissue afterwards. Yes, Ben, more questions. Um, Keith would like to know, would you ever use a three-quarter inch bowl gouge on larger bowls? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. T more timber needs to be removed. We use a bigger tool. That is... I think we used an inch and a quarter bowl gouge on a seven and a half foot bowl once. Gives you a, a good example of why you would use a bigger tool. Yes, Ben. And Sol would like to know, does the location of the headstock um, change how stable the lathe is? For example, when turning a blank that is out of balance? Um, I reckon, and I, ha I can't prove this in any way at all, but I reckon if you've got a, a, a lathe where the headstock moves up and down the bed, if it must be beneficial if you place that headstock in the centre um, of the bed between the legs um, and then face it towards you. It's got to be more stable. It just makes sense. So I reckon yes, but I have no no proof behind that. There we are. That's a shiny finish. I don't know whether you can get that at all from where you're watching but that's a really shiny finish if that works for you that type of finish fantastic um you may be uh similar to me and not like shiny finishes but if you are there we are that's how you get a shiny finish that's done so all i've got to do now and ignore this this base will be taken away right at the very end but at the moment i need that base to hold whilst i do the inside so let's have it we're going to bring this um the little dome back as well in a minute because we're going to need to face that off yes ben more questions um, so this from Maureen, um, what is the pre preferred thickness for leaving your wet, turn, uh, wet bowl turning for optimal drying performance, i.e. lack of cracking? Yeah, it depends massively. So several, several depending factors. Um, one will be the timber. Um, one will be how wet it is when you rough turned it. So is it completely green or is it the tree been down for a while? Those sorts of things. What's the um, humidity temperature? Um, weather conditions where you are in the world. Um, that's the other thing. And how thick have you, you've left it? Um, I can honestly say these bowls I've got here, one's inch and a quarter, one's inch, they're both ash. They've taken about eight to uh, eight months, eight to 12 months to dry. And that's generally enough for most timbers. Um, if you force dry them by adding heat or putting them somewhere really warm, then you're going to get cracking, far more cracking. And Sleeping Dog would like to know, as we're on finishes, um, he's been asked to make a load of um, honey spoons, honey dippers, sorry. Um, is he right to think they don't need a finish or should they be oiled? Um, 
eventually the oil will come off if you leave them if you're making them in something like ash or beach and leave them let them develop their own patina like granny's old chopping board that sort of stuff you know then then absolutely if you're using toxic timbers then I've, no um i don't use them in the first place a finish won't hide the toxicity but no beach are com is commonly used maples sycamores commonly used um ash is commonly used as well um so no you you're dead right um just bear in mind, wood, wood is porous. It will absorb moisture and it will dry out. It's just the way it is. Eventually, whatever you make in wood, if you're getting it wet continually by washing it and things like that, it will just deteriorate or wear. So the honey spoon, honey dibber, stirrer, um, regular wooden spoons, those sorts of things, eventually you will have to just throw them away and make another one. Um, and that's why you're a wood turner because you can. Um, so yes, uh, you don't have to use a finish on those. You wash them up. They won't always be gleaming and lovely and all those sorts of things because of that. So this is a regular bowl now. We just got to take the inside out. It's going to be a little bit of vibration going on because we're already a little bit thinner. Um, I'm using the C jaws at their optimum size. Let's get my light up. Remember way back, if you've been watching Woodworking Wisdoms or when I was in my workshop in the uh, in, oh, middle of last year and, and be up beyond that, actually, um, we, we started off with one of these lights. We now stock these at Axminster because I've raved on about them so much. These are now available. Axminster, who's on Axminster today, whoever you are. Would you have a search for those and put those links up? I love these. Um, these are phone chargers. They're... Um, they're a light for this sort of thing, but I've, I've got my main light up here, which is brilliant, and I use that one all the time. But when I need just something mobile, then just having a little light that I can put anywhere is really useful. Like I say, it, phone, it charges my phone and all sorts of things, but there we are. I'm going to bleach everybody out now. You're not going to see what I'm turning. Yes, Ben. So P. Jones would like to know, um, can you put wet blanks in the microwave to help with drying? You can. I used to do that a lot. Um, you can put them in the microwave for drying. The trouble is when you've got a big bowl, then it, it, your microwave, unless it's huge, um, won't cope with it. The other issue with drying in a microwave, you've got to do lots of, of small bursts at the lowest, lowest setting. Uh, it does make the microwave smell. And your kitchen, it makes it really smell as well. Um, so you might get into a bit of bother if you do too much of it. But yeah, absolutely. Um, it also kills woodworm, which is a little bit gruesome. But um, if you've got a lovely piece of timber, it's got a little bit of woodworm in it, microwave will sort that out fairly quickly for you. Yes, Ben. And just referencing the honey spoons again, uh, Chris would like to know, is olive toxic? Um, I'm, a, I'm only going to say I, I don't know for sure. I believe it, it isn't. The reason being is because it's made or it's used um, for pestles and mortars, for plates, for um, cutlery, those sorts of things. So I would have thought no, but it's worth checking. Absolutely. Yes, Ben. And Gunther would like to know, um, how deep does the tenon on the bottom of the bowl have to be, um, depending on the size of the bowl? doesn't just depend on the size of the bowl that's the issue um it depends on the speed that you're running it the timber and how sound it is and your ability as a turner so all those things factor in um so add those up if you're unsure go thicker um if the piece is small sound and you're good with the bowl gouge you can go a lot thinner and so on i don't want to give you a size however this size here i'm using a set of c jaws the bowl is around about nine inches in diameter, um, and it's a six mil, quarter inch um, deep foot. Um, because of the sea jaws, the two mil um, uh, little tooth is only being held with two mil. All right. So the best advice, I would say, the bigger you go, the bigger the set, the foot, the recess, whatever, um, uh, and, and also the depth of that recess. But if you want to be working at your optimum size as much as possible. The optimum size for all Axminster chucks is where the gap between the jaws are around about six mil or pencil width is a good way of, of um, working that out. And when I say optimum, I mean when the internal or external part of that jaw is at a perfect circle. 
Um, that means you got um, the the most surface contact, the best grip ever. Okay, so yeah, so all of those things make a factor. Like I say, that how sound the timber is, um, the jaws you're using, the speed, um, your ability, the size of the piece. There's so many things that that will dictate. There we are. I'm going to run this now about 1400 revs. We're going to clean up. I have going to. I'm going to have a sharp edge for the minute. I'm not going to do anything um, fancy with the edge. I'm just going to take that nasty corner away. Let's do, oh, let's just have a flat top. We're not going to go too thin either. Let me stop the lathe. We're going to put some extraction on. I'm getting quite a lot of dust in the air. Just, just dry, dry timber, this, this stuff. Let's have a look. I'm going to pinch for thickness. We'll go a little bit thinner than that, but we're almost there. And once I've made a decision on the thickness, then I can carry on. We can carry on and work down through the piece. And that's okay. Happy with that. Put some extraction on a moment. I'm going to stop the lathe, double check. Okay, so it's still a little bit thick at the bottom here, so we're going to take a little bit more of that away. Do you need any more light, Ben? Have another check. Right, that's consistent. Now I'm happy with that thickness. So we can go right to the center. Now I'm just going to turn a bit of light on for myself as much as anything so I can see what I'm doing. Okay, let's have a, again, we'll stop the lay, we'll have another look and see where we are thickness-wise. Okay, I can go in a lot thicker than that, actually. A lot, sorry, a lot thinner than that. That's better. So wiggle up and down when you get to that center little pith there. If you um, sometimes you can shard right past. It. So just a little wiggle up and down with the handle. Okay. 
okay let's have a have another look you know look with your hands as well so rather than looking directly into it which can mis mislead at times i'm using my fingers just to pick up any sort of lumps and bumps and it feels all right if i'm honest a little bit of a flat there which we can deal with let's go with a sharp and tall a minute <coughs> That's better. Happier with that now. Right, I'll turn the dust extraction off just for a moment. We'll have a good look inside. So there we are. So what I was doing is just making sure, first of all, I got consistency with the the, um, the thickness of bowl. And for this bowl, it needs to be really, you know, big salad bowls. You can go thicker in the rim and go thinner as you go down. But I just wanted this one to be fairly consistent. And we're ready to sand now. So I can go through the same uh, process we did on the outside. Yes, Ben. Questions? Um, so Sol would like to know what kind of grind you would recommend for the bottom of the bowl gouge, or does he even need one if he's got a secondary bevel on his main gouge? Um, it, well, I, yeah, you would do because your even your secondary bevel um, won't allow you to get right down the bottom, and bevel rubbing is really, really important when it comes to that. So I would go um, about 50, 55 degrees works. Um, for the bottom of a bowl. I tend to use 55 degrees for everything, if I'm honest. But you get a lot of people now using a 40-40 grind, um, which is great for the side of the bowl, not great for bottom feeding. Um, so maybe 55 degrees would, would be my suggestion, yeah. All right. There we are. Just extraction on again. We'll do our sanding, and then we're going to do a nice oil finish. So 100 grit first. Lay speed down a little bit just to control the dust. You're always going to get more issues on the end grain. So you've got two points of end grain on a bowl blank. The bottom of the bowl, of course, is side grain. Have a quick look, see how far we've got. Looking for those or tears, if there are any, they're right. There's a little bit of tearing going on here. Usually, if it's there, it'll be dead opposite. And there is just a little bit of tearing down there as well. That's just where you're going against the grain. Um, it's the same for everybody, that. So, a little bit more attention on there. There we are, that'll do. Then we can go 150. There we are. Right now to the rotary sander. If you remember, we're going to go to 180 first. And you might need to speed the, the um, lathe up a little bit for a rotary sander just to get the momentum going. That was a 180, so let's have a look, see what we're left with now on the bowl. Good, yeah, so 240. No 
there we are. Now we'll go a hand sanding with a 400. <coughs> Excuse me. That's a nice, a nice bit of wood there. Lovely bit of timber. A lot going on in that piece of timber. So we're going to put. A, was it a food safe oil or just an oil? Yeah, they said um, tannaseo wax on the outside, food safe on the inside. Food safe oil. Definitely is food safe oil. It says so on the bottle. All right, so food safe oil is a clear oil, generally mineral oils. And what we're going to do with this one, and we'll apply it with a bit of tissue. You can do it with a, um, a brush as well. That'll give you a good coating. But uh, let's just pop it on with a tissue for the moment. And we want a good soaking. You want it to really absorb into the timber. And we're going to sand it in. We're going to use a 600 grit abrasive to sand it in. We're doing the same thing as... We're done with the sanding sealer, if you think about it. We're raising the grain. It is a liquid. So the grain's rising up. And what we're going to do is then sand it off. Now, I want to be careful. I don't want to get any of this all down the side of the bowl. Otherwise, I'll ruin that, that wax finish. There we are. Put that to one side. Lay speed to zero. Turn the machine on. And just trickle. If you go too fast now, of course, you're going to get covered in oil. Okay, it just fly off with that centrifugal force. Yes, Ben. So we've got a question from Gunther. Um, what's the advantage of um, hand sanding with 400 over the rotary? Um, I find it gives a slightly brighter finish, if I'm honest. Um, it, if you just finish straight off the, the rotary sander, it's a little bit... Um, satin in its finish if you know what i mean uh, as opposed to the sort of silkiness or, or almost gloss that you get from a hand sanding with a 400 and then eventually a 600 if you want to get really shiny you know anyway, what we're doing there can we go overhead a minute ben i just want to show um that abrasive if, it, if it'll focus on it so it's developing sort of like a paste the, the oil and the dust and that paste is filling the grain. You get a real silky feel um, to the piece when you finish in this way. It's the old technique of sanding, uh, finishing with oil as well. It's really effective. Now, let's use some shavings. I'm going to pop around the other side of the lathe a minute. I've spotted some really nice shavings that work well. We want those nice ribbony shavings. Nothing too coarse when you're going to burnish with shavings. And these are spot on. These are perfect. Really nice, not too coarse, and make a really nice little pad. I can now turn the laser speed up a bit, and this is going to take off all that excess slurry, really, that's built up with that dust and, and wax together. There we are. Again, get your tissue. We always finish up by buffing with a bit of tissue, it's soft surface. go all right let's just take that off i want to show you the difference here in finish got a few more questions we'll do as well but so that's perfect ben thank you now that's my type of finish i like that it's not all over glossy but it's got a real depth and warmth to it um i would put that as a sort of silky finish as opposed to the gloss. Lots of people love the gloss finish, though. So that's just my preference. I prefer that silkiness of the inside more than the gloss of the outside. Okay, there we are. So what we need to do now is take this off. This is not the finished base. So we go back with our tailstock. Yes, Ben, let's have another question or two. 
Martin's asking, would the application be different for a lemon oil? No, nope, exactly the same. Difference with lemon oils and citrus oils um, um, over finishing oils, because I would put the um, food safe oil in the same sort of realms as the lemon oils, uh, citrus oils. They don't have drying agents in. They're natural oils, um, so they do take longer to dry. Um, but all oils are finished in the same way. The good thing with the finishing oil is toy safe over um, food safe. Toy safe just means once dry, it can be mouthed. Um, a true food safe oil means it's, it's um, safe when wet. So you can put wet foods on it and it what comes off won't harm you. Um, that's, the, that's the big difference. They're not the same thing. They are very different. Um, generally, uh, the testings for... Um, toy safe are, are testings for heavy metals so when they go through that that vigorous testing it, it, that's what they're checking for um so but yeah they, they they're all done in exactly the same way they're all applied in the same way let's just put our little dome back on we will come back to the chuck very briefly in a minute just to finish the last little nib but what i want to do now look is just take off the remainder of that foot many ways to do this i mean this is my pref preference because it's nice and quick doesn't matter what the size of the bowl is it all works um but you've of course you've got things like button jaws if that's in shot right down in my far in the far corner button jaws is a big set there uh, wood plate jaws so you've seen me use before i haven't got any on display here but wood plate jaws um uh, vacuum chucking of course is that way um all those sorts of things work um this is my way it's a quick way well, it's not my way it's been done for years ignore that little bit of noise I'll answer the question before I carry on because that'll be a very odd putting. Yes. Um, so, P. Jones, um, when doing the inside of a bowl, um, when it gets to the centre, it's getting a lot of chattering on the gouge. Bevel bounce. That's all that is. Um, that that just takes a bit of practice to get rid of that. It's basically a little bit too much pressure on the bevel. You've got conflicting grain. You've got um, uh, different densities of grain hitting the bevel at the same time. So uh, I would go back, sharpen the chisel one more time to do a finishing cut, then maybe change, tweak the speed a little bit, maybe by about 50 revs, and have another fresh, a fresh attack. Um, but a, a finer cut, that's all. Let's give that a go. And Terry's asking, um, would you use a methylated spirit to clean out the dust after sanding? No. No, especially the dyed, the purple stuff, um, because that will, that will taint the timber. No, um, an airline, a handbrush, anything like that, that'll, that'll work. So all we're going to do is just take away the excess. Have a quick look. Yeah, we're nice and flat. All I've got to do now is sand, and then we can remove that final nib again. Yes, Ben? So a couple of questions just come in. Um, first of all, uh, from a Japan company, would you? how would you recommend rechucking to remove a tenon on a bowl that's too shallow to work on a standard jam chuck? I think this is probably be one of the better ways to do that. Um, we can pretty much take away anything. It's just holding between centers. It's a good way. We are going to take this away in a minute. I'll show you how to do that also. But I, I quite like this method. It, it's an easy way of working. 
Um, you don't need any any other way of holding, nothing to grip the rim, anything like that. And Jim B's asking, where's the buzzing coming from? So that's the friction here, Jim. I might may not have my lathe centered up, um, or it may just be the springing of the timber here. So one of that, but uh, but that's it. So just a quick sand. So I'm starting with the 150, then we'll go 240. Then I'll go 400. There we are. So that's all we can do at the moment with that nib there. We've got to remove that nib next. So let's pop the chuck back on. So that's what we got to remove next, just that little nib. down there my chuck can go back on i'm just going to simply use the head from my rotary sander now that one can go conveniently inside the chuck right in the center and i need to go with something quite coarse so i'm going to start with a 120 grit lay speed can go a little bit higher dust extractor on hand and we're just removing the nib I'm going to try and keep this in shot as much as possible That was a 120. If we go down to 240. And then finally, we'll finish with the 400 grit. Okay, right, hang on there. So what we'll have a look at now, we've got a few more questions, but let me just wipe that off. And I'm going to get this as best as I can right up close to the camera, because I want you to see, you know, that does leave a good finish. Now, that's a 400 grit, but it's a, a really pretty finish there. There's no signs of that nib left. And that's quite important. We don't want any raises, no gravy bumps or anything like that there. All we want to do is see that lovely grain. Okay, and that's all ready. It's no finish on there at the moment. So if you want to put your mark on there, your signature, you can do that. And then it'd be your choice, choice on a bowl like this where we've got wax on the outside, oil on the inside. Your choice as to what you want to put on that base. Personally, I'll go oil, but there. What a pretty bit of timber that is. Yes, Ben, more questions. So Fuller's asking, would a vacuum chuck hold the bowl for yeah. removing the final nib without the tailstock centre? Absolutely. Vacuum chuck would be up there. My my options down here. Uh, vacuum chuck is the best way because there's no tailstock or anything like that. Then we go jaws. 
they'll grip onto it nicely again. Tailstock won't be there. And various sets of jewels will do that, that option. For me, that's very quick. And it doesn't cost me anything as well. Okay, so in terms of how much you're going to spend, we go my method, jaws, vacuum chuck. Okay, but absolutely, if you've got one, you're very lucky. Um, but yeah, it'd be perfect for it. All right, we're all done. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm really sorry about that delay on startup. We were um, baffled as to what it could have been, but we got there in the end. Um, uh, tomorrow we are always oh, Jason tomorrow no Ben tomorrow what's tomorrow Ben you tomorrow isn't it yep tomorrow I'm back on the pyro pyrography and then we're doing um colors and the difference between stains and paints and things like that fantastic we both myself and Ben are doing a, a collaboration next week we're going to try a basket weave bowl I'll turn it Ben's going to decorate it so another collaboration for me and Ben next week so thanks again guys thank you ever so much for being so patient for stopping by and watching us here at Woodworking Wisdom um, my name's Colin Way and I'll see you next time bye bye <laughs>